Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about a few words that I take issue with in the Bible. And when I say that, I'm going to be talking about words in today's contemporary English that we use and and how they're probably off what the original meaning was when they were first breathed out from the mouth of God. You're having coffee with Conrad on. Conrad Rocks! Welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Rocks of Revelation being poured out to you. My passion is for you to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Now, in the last podcast, I went on and on about the word unicorn and how it's only found in the King James Bible and how it affects us. You know, it causes sub subconscious minds to spin out of control wildly and to go off into outer space and maybe have to reboot and press the reset button. So this type of thing affects us in our Bible reading today. There's these preconceived ideas, presuppositions that are going on while we're reading the Bible, and sometimes they can actually block the spirit of truth. Now today I'm going to be talking about a few more words that I think that there's a cause for pause. There's going to be a cause for concern with some of these words. And first off, I'm not an expert, okay? I'm not sitting here with a PhD. I I, I just see there's something going on here. I'm just a guy that likes comparing Bible translations, and I'm often astounded at how wildly they vary. Have you ever been reading along with a pastor, and he might be reading some weird translation, and you're reading your faithful translation, and you're going, wait a minute, that's not what that means. Wait, they're not the same thing. How many times do I have to say that two things that are not the same thing are not the same thing? I believe that we need to get to closest, at, as close as we can to the inspired moment when the text was put down, the original autographs. That's where we can come the closest to the true essence of what God was speaking as he breathed through holy men of God. Jesus says to beware of the scribes in Luke twenty forty six. When we see all these different translations and paraphrases going around today, I can totally see why the Lord warns us. You are having coffee with Comrade on ConradRocks.net. Now, you've probably heard me say this in some earlier podcasts, but there's a word I take issue with. It's Pashka. And uh it's Passover. You know, that's why how it's supposed to be translated and The King James is faithful to that, usually. But it's also the only translation that takes the original word Pascha and says uh, from Passover. It goes ahead and changes it to Easter, and it bucks all of the other English translations. The Greek word Pascha is correctly translated as Passover 28 times in the New Testament in the King James. However, there's one time... It is suspiciously translated as Easter in Acts 12, 4. And when they had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, I've had a lot of conversations about this. And you will once you start talking about this, you're probably going to run into the King James only people. Uh, for bringing this up in social media or in some of the Christian forums. Now, I admire the King James only people. They're very good defenders of the faith. You know, they're digging in their heels. But sometimes you really have to step back and wonder why the King James translators would all of a sudden change a word in the Bible. I love the King James. It's the only Bible. It's the main, it's the Bible I read and I listen to because it's it's key to the to the Strongs. I've been listening to it for over 20 years, and when I think in biblical terms, I normally think in the King James vernacular. Somebody gave me an NIV one time, and I was reading that for a while, and I also had an NIV audio Bible, but I started noticing that they'd taken out a lot of Bible verses. So I'm like, whoa. So I quickly went to the King James, especially when I found out that the King James has the Strong's numbers, which is a uh, uh, it's a lexicon for you know the underlying languages. I, I just like getting to the to the root. But I've never been a King James only apologist. So when I got into the eSword, now eSword is a donation or free Bible study software that I really recommend you get for your computer. I started digging into the underlying Greek and Hebrew, which it provides, you know, many different uh, 
uh, open source Bibles or public domain Bibles and many public domain lexicons like the Thayers and the Strongs for free. So when you dig into the underlying or original languages, you can clearly see that the word Pascha is Passover. That's what it is. And unquestionably, Jesus Christ was Jewish and he observed Pascha, Passover. Jesus never kept an Easter in his life. So how is the word Pascha and even the holy day? They changed the date. (laughs) Who changed the day Jesus observed? regarding his body and his blood. Where is the biblical record confirming the authority for this replacement of the word in the day? Now, it's also pretty obvious that the early New Testament church did not observe Easter. They continued observing Passover, but with a new significance in understanding. We can see in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, Luke 22, 15 through 22, that Jesus and Paul both celebrated the Jewish Passover with a new context. With this established, how then was it changed from the 14th of Nisan? That's when when God prescribes it in the Bible. That's Passover. To the Sunday following the first full moon after the vernal equinox. That's how pagans do things. And then it was assigned the pagan name Ishtar, Ishtarde, Ishtar. How'd that happen? You got to think about it, right? I mean, you may be thinking it's, oh, it's just a little word that was changed. This can be a big deal. (laughs) This is not a minor change, but it's something very huge. The audacity to not only change the biblical word, but to change the religious holiday to the date of a pagan holiday and even give it a pagan name. Well, it turns out that there was a controversy in the early church about whether they should celebrate Passover on the Jewish date, which was the 14th day of Nisan, or whether they should change it to the pagan tradition of Easter. So now I've included a link in the show notes if you want to dig a little further, but basically this was all done at the Council of Nicaea in 325 by Emperor Constantine. You probably heard me talk about him a few times. A lot of good came out of that council, but one of the things they did was change the date of the celebration. Now that's 325 AD. That's way after the crucifixion and and resurrection. So they decided to change it to the pagan day of Easter rather than the traditional Jewish biblical celebration of Passover. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say that through all these conversations that I've had in the forums and in the social media, there are many people that disagree with my position on this. They're basically saying the King James translators knew that this king mentioned in Acts 12 was a pagan and he was actually celebrating the pagan holiday. That does not change the fact that the underlying Greek word was Pascha. The Bible says Pascha, right? And this means that the translators would have taken liberty to actually change the underlying word. That would scare me. To be honest, I'm glad I'm not a translator. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but that, that, that reminds me of Martin Luther adding a word to Scripture in his German translation. He added the word alone in Romans 3.28 to make it say faith alone. Romans 3.28 in the King James says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So Luther added faith alone, right? Now, why did Luther do this? Because of his doctrine. He did it because that... That was his doctrine. His doctrine superseded his faithfulness to translate the Bible word for word as much as he could. You know, he wasn't being faithful to the underlying Greek word for faith, which is pistis. Like I said, I'm not an expert. But I did read somewhere that adding to or taking away from the words written in this book is not going to work out too well. For those that do that, read Revelation 22.9 to find out what I'm talking about. So I would be afraid to let my doctrine change the text in any way. Now, I'm grateful for Luther. Okay, I'm grateful. But I'm just saying, man, this is like really touching something. This is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. We need to take this seriously. I'm very glad that people translated the Bible into common languages. I even applaud them for it. But I'm I'm also glad I'm I'm not the one that did it. There's too much at stake, and the stakes are very high. 
you know, I was listening to a few books on script about how the, the Bible uh, has been translated throughout the centuries and how many mistakes there actually were. I think one of them, the Dutch Bible said they actually committed adultery or something. So, I mean, you know, there there have been some errors along the way. So we need to pay attention. And back to the King James here. I still like the King James Bible. It's a good friend of mine for over 20 years. But I think that... that uh, Easter is rather unfortunate rendering for the word Pascha. Also keep in mind that Christians ignorantly celebrate the pagan celebration. You know, my people perish for lack of knowledge, Hosea 4, 6. Idolatry should be a no-brainer for Bible readers. Children start thinking about the Easter bunny and hunting Easter eggs and actually participate in the pagan worship. They actually go hunt for the eggs and everything. It's not in the Bible. And when the children find out that the Easter bunny is not real, they're going to equate that to the resurrection of Jesus not being real because they're celebrating him at the same time. They're linked together in the same way, pretty much the way Santa Claus in Christmas. They're thinking about presents. And then when their bubbles burst about the Santa Claus, well, they're probably going to equate that with the birth of Christ as well. This is a crushing blow to a child when they realize that Santa isn't real and they're going to equate Santa Claus, and the Easter Bunny with Christianity. The next word I'm going to take an issue with is the English word world. Now, you may not have thought about this, but it it kind of crept up on me over the years of my Bible reading. And here's a couple of, uh, I'm going to read three verses here from the King James. Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the world. Amen. Matthew thirteen forty nine. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angel shall come forth and shall sever the wicked from among the just. Matthew twenty four three, the Olivet Discourse, of course. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So I want you to be honest with me here. When you think of these passages about the end of the world, You think of pilots and planes disappearing and planes crashing from the sky, nuclear bombs exploding, huge meteors coming to the earth, and a bunch of armies fighting each other that look like zombies that cannot die. Legions of satanic armies coming out of the depths of hell and taking over the earth. That is what you think, right? So have you ever examined the core root of that belief? Now, that's because... A lot of popular eschatology books out there, like the Left Behind series, there is this uh, supposed secret flyaway rapture, and then all the earth just goes nuts, and the earth explodes, and somehow there's a new heaven and a new earth. And in each of the preceding verses that I read to you, they talk about the end of the world. Now, in each one of those verses, the underlying Greek word for it is eon. Eon. And this is where some of the other translations kind of get it right. From the Vine's New Testament world, okay, eon. And here's what it means. An age, a period of time. An age, a period of time. Marked in the New Testament usage by spiritual or moral characteristics is sometimes translated world. The phrase, the end of the world, should be rendered the end of the age in most places. So you see how that's a problem? That's a big problem when we apply our contemporary connotation to the word world. I like to read history. You know, I was reading some physics books, and I was exploring some of the early writings of people like Copernicus and other scientists from a long time ago. And they were using the word world in their contemporary sense to describe what we would call today the universe. Right, So we, we would call what we have today the universe, but they, they didn't have the comprehension of the universe like we do now, back then when Copernicus was around. So he would say world, and we would think, oh, he's talking about the universe. You can tell that from the context of the way he uses the word world. And I was reading some of these old books by very old physicists, and you could tell that A lot of them, it wasn't just Copernicus, but a lot of them were using the word world to represent the universe. 
I don't even know if they had the word universe around. I don't know. I just thought of that right now. But words change over time and even in our own lifetimes. And probably at the time when the King James translators translated this word world, it was probably understood to mean something different than it does now. Like I said, I'm not an expert, but I do know an epoch of time is certainly not the earth. They're two different things. Conrad Rock Stitcher, iTunes, Spreaker, going global for Jesus. Now, think about this. When we're reading this end of the world, and when you change the end of the world and then the end of the age, they mean two different things. And when I was reading this King James end of the world, you know, I've subscribed to this whole let's sell everything and move to the mountains uh, crowd because of my misunderstanding of this word world. Think about it. End of the age? What what do you think about it? If Jesus says, I'll be with you even till the end of the age, what does that mean to you? I will be with you even till the end of this epoch of time, or I'll be with you to the, at the end of the world. Now, that's going to cause you to think two different things. Now, next, I'm going to take issue with the word obey. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey them which have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must have account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So now I'm going to go to the vines. It's uh, patho, to persuade, to win over. Okay, now I'm, I'm describing the word obey. I want you to keep in mind your contemporary definition of the word obey And then here's what it meant in the original Greek when this was written down. It means to persuade, to win over in the passive and middle voices, or to be persuaded, to listen to, to obey, is so used with this meaning in the middle voice. He gives a bunch of scripture references. Then he says, the obedience suggested is not by submission to authority, but resulting from persuasion. The obedience suggests it is not by submission to authority, but resulting from persuasion. Then he goes on here, patho and pistuio. You know, pistuio means to trust. We It's sometimes translated as the word believe, like in John 3.16. They're closely related by etymology. So the difference in meaning is that the former implies the obedience that is produced by the latter, where the disobedience of the Israelites is said to be the evidence of their unbelief. So they disobeyed, and that was the evidence of their unbelief. Faith is in the heart, invisible to men. Obedience is of, is of the conduct and may be observed. Now, he says something interesting here. When a man obeys God, he gives the only possible evidence that in his heart he believes God. Of course, it is this persuasion of the truth that results in faith. We believe because we are persuaded that the thing is true. A thing does not become true because it is believed. But patho in New Testament suggests an actual and outward result of the inward persuasion in consequent faith. There you go. So I don't want you to think that I'm some type of a total anarchist shrugging off all cords of authority. I have seen this word in this idea originating in obeying the bishop. I've been reading the early church fathers and early church history and uh, the letters from Ignatius. He even says obeying the bishop is the same as obeying Christ. So you can see this, how this word, they capitalize on it and start running to score a touchdown for ironclad uh, authority over people, the lording it over the people. So he was planting ideas of obeying the bishop to almost a level to where it sounds Hitler-esque, okay? And just as we talked about earlier about how Tyndale was killed for treason for translating the Bible in English, he basically was exposing or bringing to light the fact that the Greek word ekklesia really means congregation or assembly. The word is still translated as church in our King James Bible. But what happened with this about the time of the Reformation when the Catholic Church was lording it over the laity, that's what they were doing. They were lording it, lording over the laity, with an iron fist. And as a side note here, many people think, the reason I'm talking about lording it over the the lady is that may be the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing Jesus hates. 
Remember, God hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You can read that in the book of Revelation. So back then when they were doing this, people were burned at the stake. Now, this is how serious words are, okay? People were burned at the stake for not believing the way the corporate institutional church believed. It's very important. You might want to go ahead and read Fox's Book of Martyrs on Scribd. You can read or listen to it on Scribd free for two months with a link. I'm going to provide a link to how you can get Scribd free for two months in the show notes. Um, I'm really excited about Scribd because right now it's unlimited ebooks and audiobooks. It's like Netflix for audiobooks. It rocks. And I use Scribd for a lot of my research. Like I said, you can get two months free with my link in the show notes. While you're there, check out Fox's Book of Martyrs. Continuing on. So as I'm reading all this church history in the, the early church fathers, you see this doctrine emerge. Now, this is after the Bible was written, but you can see how they want the power to be in the bishop's hands. And you can see how it's a little, it becomes a little different from how, how uh, Paul says, you know, to desire to be a bishop, it's a good thing. But they're, they're making it like this institutional thing where they lord it over the people, um, so much so that the naysayers or the dissenters were killed like Tyndale was. So this is one of the reasons today we talk about separation of church and state, you know, no official church state. And the church has often had authority to kill people. <laughs> they killed people over doctrinal issues. What would happen today if our doctrinal arguments on Facebook or on forums or whatever, what if, what if one of us was like burned at the stake for having a disagreement? Well, that's what would happen back then. The Bible clearly says to remember those in authority over us who have spoken to us the word of God. See Hebrews 13, 7 and 17. But the word obedience doesn't necessarily mean what our contemporary English word means today. So we are to be persuaded to follow their faith, as Vines points out in the original Greek. Vines points out that faith comes from that persuasion. He says, the obedience suggested is not by submission to authority, but resulting from persuasion. In other words, a leader will inspire someone to follow them. Now, let's take this a little bit further in today's contemporary, you know, what's going on in the church today. You may recall the shepherding movement controversy that happened uh, back in the 70s, I think so. And it actually still continues on to this day. I've actually, I have personally met people that will not change jobs. They won't move. They won't get married. They won't buy a new car. They won't cross the street without express permission from their pastor. They are simply taking very seriously what the scripture tells them to do in their mind. They say, obey, you know, on all points, all points. So what if they're on their knees in their prayer closet and God speaks to them and says, take a job at a daycare center. But the pastor says, oh, no, you need to keep working at the casino because you're making a lot of money there. So you see how this can run into a problem. There's a disparity between God and man. So I am all for submitting to a pastor or a, a having a mentoring type relationship. But the relationship I'm watching here and I'm seeing in the Bible, I'm seeing how Timothy submitted to Paul through faith, how Elisha submitted to Elijah. He washed the hands of Elijah. So let's let's examine our hearts here against the scripture in this following scenario. Okay, I want you to think about this. If your pastor came over to your house and started ordering your children around, wouldn't that seem a little weird? Don't you get some kind of check in your spirit? Like, who's this guy? He's getting into my domain of authority. These are my kids. You see where there's a disparity there? Or... Let's say that the pastor came over to your house with his brand new car that from all that tithe money, and he ordered you to clean his car. Now, that, don't you get a check in your spirit there? Don't you kind of say, wait a minute, that's from the tenor of the Bible and from the spirit of God in me. That's not the obey that comes to mind in pastoral or shepherding relationship. Now, to balance this out here and to somewhat contradict myself, let's say where someone's getting off drugs. Okay, or they've fallen upon the rock of Jesus Christ. You know, I have so many testimonies on my show uh, about people how they've fallen upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And I often say when you hit rock bottom, Jesus is the rock at the bottom. And right there, um, their lives are changed. 
and they realize that their thinking patterns that they have, they've only dug the pit deeper that they're in and they've got to get out. And that's when Jesus reaches down. So they'll oftentimes check into a very good Christian rehab place and they're going to be transformed by the renewing of their mind. They actually have to renew their mind. They have to change their thinking patterns. Like, you know, in Romans 12, verse 2, which is one chapter before those obeying those in authority over us, which is uh, Hitler's favorite chapter, by the way. But if your thinking is getting you into trouble, and it's rebellious in nature, and it's not submitted to God, you know, submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, then I can see where you might want to submit to someone in a rehab environment, you know, where you might want to learn the value of discipline, because your thinking has really gotten you in trouble. In this context, I kind of see that obeying, it may not make sense to you. Understanding is not a prerequisite to obedience. When God says to do something, you don't have to understand it before you're obedient. You just have to believe that he has, you know, he knows what he's doing and he's got your best interest in the long run at heart. So when we're obeying this person, though, the context of the Bible, where he clearly attenuates this throughout Scripture, is to submit to the nature, character, and authority of Jesus Christ, not outside the will of God, but safely inside it. You see what I'm saying? You're not going to obey this. You're not going to obey a person blindly if he says, "Go march off the cliff." You know, it's going to be within the nature, character, and authority of Jesus Christ. So, so taking this analogy a little bit further, someone who has a speck in their eye. They will want to follow someone to where they have removed the beam out of their eye already. This is the type of obedience that I think the Bible is talking about. They're persuaded. They see this person is successful in Christ. I'm going to submit to them. Kind of like a rabbi-disciple relationship. Kind of like how the disciples followed Jesus. Kind of like how Timothy followed Paul. They were persuaded. They saw that their mentors were were in tight with God, and they wanted some of that too. So you see, my problem really isn't with the word obey, and it really isn't with the translation of it as much as the way we perceive this word in our contemporary definition of the word. Now, exploring this a little bit further, okay, the Germans that put the Jews in the gas chambers had the popular defense, quote, I was only following orders. Unquote, or I was only obeying orders, right? They said they were only obeying those in authority over them. Basically, they were obeying those in authority over them so much so that they killed people. <laughs> do you see where do you see where I'm going with this? Now, this leads me to the passage about obeying as unto the Lord. Wives, obey your husbands as unto the Lord. Guess what? That's not what that verse says. Here it is correctly. Ephesians 5.22 Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So just like the Germans at the Nuremberg trials didn't get away with the phrase, I was only following orders, they were killing Jews against their conscience, and they were pawning that off to like, I was, I was just following those in authority over me. Remember, Romans 13 was Hitler's favorite biblical chapter. They were obeying those in authority over them. They were probably using Romans 13 to get it off their conscience, but they were not submitting as unto the Lord. Okay? Wives are to submit to their husbands, but notice that it's unto the Lord. If it's something the Lord would not have you do, do not do it. Like kill Jews in a gas chamber, for example. Now, studying this, I've often thought it fascinating how people would just blindly obey Hitler. And I stumbled across the Milgram experiment. Uh, Stanley Milgram did an experiment back in the, the 60s, I believe. And if you haven't heard of this experiment, you've really got to dig into it. It's very interesting. He talks about obedience. The experimenter, here, here it is. Um, I'm going to quote, I think, some out of uh, Wikipedia here. He was fascinated with why, why uh, remember, this was when, when uh, World War II was freshly over. You know, it was 1965 is, you know, it was still fresh in people's minds. And he was, he wanted to know why people would obey Hitler so blindly. So he did these experiments. The experimenter E orders the teacher T, 
the subject of the experiment to give what the latter believes are painful electric shocks to a learner, L, who is actually an actor and confederate. The subject is led to believe for, for each wrong answer, the learner was receiving actual electric shocks. Though in reality, there was no such punishments. Being separated from the subject, the Confederate set up a tape recorder integrated with the electroshock generator, which played pre-recorded sounds for each shock level. You can find this on YouTube and Wikipedia. It's pretty awesome. The Milgram experiment on the obedience to authority figures was a series of social psychology experiments conducted by Yale University psychologist Stanley Milgram. They measured the willingness of study participants, men from a diverse range of occupations with varying levels of education, to obey an authority figure who instructed them to perform acts conflicting with their personal conscience. Participants were led to believe that they were assisting an unrelated experiment in which they had to administer electric shocks to a learner. These fake electric shocks gradually increased to levels that would have been fatal had they been real. Now, this is amazing here. The experiment found unexpectedly that a very high proportion of men would fully obey the instructions, albeit reluctantly. See, they were reluctant, but they did it. Anyway, we are the servants of whom we actually obey. That's a scripture. Milgram first described his research in a 1963 article in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology and later discussed his findings in greater depth in his 1974 book, Obedience to Authority, an Experimental View. The experiments began in July 1961 in the basement of Lindsley Chittenden Hall at Yale University three months after the start of the trial of German Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. Milgram devised his psychological study to answer the popular contemporary question, could it be that Eichmann and his million accomplices in the Holocaust were just following orders? Could we call them all accomplices? The experiment was repeated many times around the globe with fairly consistent results. Now, I mentioned a, a scripture earlier. I believe that who we actually obey is who we believe, whether it be the doctrine of the world or the doctrine of the word. Paul says in Romans 6.16, 6, he says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So when they were pushing this button, they believed the person in authority over them, even though it was against their conscience. You know how God has, has written on our hearts that we're not to kill people. I mean, you know, there's the, the, there's the Spirit of God that prompts us to not do these grievous sins. However, they acquiesce to that to obey the person in authority over them. Stanley Milgram's experiments were repeated many times, and you can find them all over the place on YouTube. There's books and audio books on Scribd, and you can find some free, free videos on YouTube where uh, this experiment is done over and over again. It'll blow your mind. How many people blindly submit to authority, even against their conscience, in very large numbers? So now when I look at the word obey in the Bible, and I, I think of these Stanley Milgram experiments, and, and I think of how people obey, obeyed Hitler to kill people in World War II, I, I have to add the attenuator in my spirit as unto the Lord. Okay, I have to think of that when I hear the word obey. So hopefully that sheds some light. Yeah, I may be, it may sound like I'm complaining about a few words, but you can see how when we, when we have our presuppositional beliefs and we're reading the Bible without the Spirit of God, we can actually believe things that are not perfectly accurate, you see? And as a thank you for being a Conrad Rocks listener, you can get two free months on Scribd. Um, I'm going to provide a link in the show notes where you can actually get two free months to try it out. If you contact them directly, you're only going to get one. Scribd is an unlimited ebook and audiobook service with a great selection of audiobooks and ebooks. And you can read a lot about the Milgram experiment. I see there's some documents and some audiobooks that talk about it there. Um, Scribd is a service that I use every day. Um, I listen to or read something from Scribd pretty much every day. Anyway, God bless you. I want to thank you for being in my life. Hopefully this podcast has illuminated something to you to where you can see, hey, you know, we need to pay attention to what we 
put in our eyes. We need to pay attention to the words that are that we're reading and to the audio that we're listening to. God bless you. Thank you for being in my life. Until we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.